。那呃，你在你的诊间怎么去跟病人沟通这件事呢？我们下一位讲师，我们 schedule 有一点点修改，是这个啊、呃、，Dr. Wen d i Singer。那他本身是一个家庭医师，那以前他也是跟所有的医生一样，是在呃这个医学中心里面。可是呃，他在呃。呃，这个呃训练的过程中，受到 Dr. John Kelly 还有 Dr. Hans 的影响呢，他决定要走这个呃 lifestyle medicine。那非常幸运的，他现在的这个医学的这个 practice 呢，就是呃 focus 在 lifestyle medicine。那我们今天非常荣幸可以邀请他来跟我们分享，就是在临床上他怎么呃去辅导病人做这种 lifestyle change。我们一起欢迎啊、呃、Dr. Wayne d i s i n g e r 欢迎来到这里。这是一个荣幸，我是一个非常荣幸的来宾。Dr. Dr. Kelly and Dr. Deal. So I have a question. How many of you are practicing clinicians? How many of you see patients and talk to them about nutrition? So some of you, others of you, I guess, are, are researchers and, and interested parties. What we're going to be talking about today, um, what I'm going to be talking about is Practical um, nutrition prescriptions. So we're going to talk uh, some about the science behind nutrition prescriptions, and then we'll be talking about uh, specific uh, types of nutrition and nutrition prescriptions for those specific types. So just a little bit about uh, the concept of nutrition prescriptions. Uh, in lifestyle medicine, there is an article that was published in JAMA in 2010. Uh, that looks at the physician competencies for lifestyle medicine. One of the core competencies uh, in this is writing what's called here specific written action plans as a lifestyle medicine prescription. So this is uh, what nutrition prescriptions are coming from. The United States Preventive Services Task Force recommends that lifestyle medicine interventions around nutrition and physical activity should be intensive and focused on behavioral interventions. So that's what a good nutrition prescription needs to do. This is a study looking at exercise prescriptions. Uh, in this uh, study, they looked at about 4,000 people, and some of them, when they walked out of the doctor's office, they walked out with a specific written prescription that was uh, tailored for their needs. The other ones just received verbal advice. So the ones that received the specific written prescription had a statistically significant better ability to continue exercise after they left. So writing something down and giving it to your patient makes a difference. This is an exercise. In nutrition, we don't have a similar study. We don't have a study that, that looked at 4,000 patients and looked at the difference, but there's reason to believe that it would be similar. One of the nice things about nutrition prescriptions is that anybody can do that. You don't have to be a physician. You don't even have to be a dietitian. Uh, you can be somebody's mother or somebody's friend and still give them a nutrition prescription. So let's look at what a nutrition prescription should look like. We use the mnemonic SMART in English with SMART standing for specific measurable, accountable, realistic, and time-oriented. So if we look at each one of those in detail, uh, if you want to write a nutrition prescription, it's better if you write a specific food. So we don't say you need to eat less saturated fats or you need to eat less sugar. 
We, we say a specific type of food, so you need to eat more apples or more. You can sometimes do a food category like cruciferous vegetables, but it needs to be specific. So when the patient or the person that you're interacting with walks out of the room, they know exactly what you're talking about. It needs to be measurable. So if I tell my patient, I want you to eat more beans, for instance, I need to tell them how much beans I want them to eat. I need to say you need to eat one cup a day or, or something very specific. So measured either by, by amount or, or by the, the size of what you're eating. So we need to make sure as we're writing a nutrition prescription that we understand what's going on in that person's food environment. So who's shopping for the food, who's preparing the food, who oversees the budget and the different components of, of food in the household. All of those things make a difference as far as our nutrition prescription. It also needs, we also need to account for what's available. Obviously, you're not going to write a, a prescription for a food that you can't get. Uh, what does the budget allow? What does time allow? What will the patient actually do? So, this uh, a whole other piece that we won't talk about here is the concept of motivational interviewing and, and finding out what a patient is actually going to do. There also needs to be a connection to time. So, if, if I give a nutrition prescription, I need to say this needs to happen every day or every week, um, or that needs to happen at least two meals a day. And, and ideally, I need to put a time connection for how long they want, I want them to do it too. If I tell a patient that I want you to stop eating cheese, and I just sort of leave it as no cheese for the rest of your life, uh, some people won't like that very much. But if I say I want you to stop eating cheese for three months, People say, well, I can do that. I'll, I'll try that. So that's, that's the general guidelines as far as how we write nutrition prescriptions. Generally, a specific food. Um, occasionally, a nutritional category. Um, but generally, we, we stick with a specific food so the patient walks out of there knowing exactly what they're going to do. Now, um, again, this is in English. I'm not sure how it would be in, in Mandarin or other languages, but uh, in English, we use the mnemonic FAT and we, we make it opposite. So it's the opposite of FAT. Um, it's the type of food, the amount of food, and the frequency. And this would be an example of that type of nutrition prescription. So we're, we're prescribing uh, Brazil nuts to someone who needs more selenium. And we say we want them to have three nuts uh, daily for the next six months. Nutrition prescriptions can be positive prescriptions, meaning we're asking people to eat more of a particular type of food, or they can be negative prescriptions. And negative prescriptions, we're asking them to eat less of a particular type of food. I like to give positive prescriptions as much as I give negative prescriptions. People get tired if they only get negative prescriptions, so uh, we want to give them some of both. Now when we talk about uh, nutrition prescriptions, there's a, a new tool that's come out over the last uh, year or so that I use quite a bit with my patients. It's a, an app uh, that you can get on your uh, cell phone. Again, this is in English. Um, I suspect that if uh, someone wanted to translate it into uh, Mandarin, that uh, Dr. Michael Greger, who developed this app, would be very happy to, to have you do that. So if anybody here wants to be the translator of this app, let me know and I'll uh, contact Dr. Greger and, and uh, see what he's willing to do. But I suspect he'd be very happy to do it. But this, this app um, gives examples of, of the whole um, spectrum of positive nutrition prescriptions. So you can see, see here, there's beans. Um, you're supposed to have three servings of beans every day in this app. Berries, one a day, and you can go down. There's a total of, uh, it, it goes down, down further down here. 
There's a total of 24 boxes that you're supposed to fill in every day. Actually, 18 of those boxes are to do with food. Um, six of them are to do with exercise and water. Um, but there's, there's 18 servings of, of food that you're supposed to eat every day. All good, healthy, positive food. Uh, and if your patient eats those 18 servings every day, uh, then they do well. So with some of my patients, I'll go straight to this app. Not every patient's ready uh, for uh, advice that's this complicated. Uh, a lot of my patients, I give very simple nutrition prescriptions, but some of them will, will go straight to this app. Okay, that's a little background around the science behind making nutrition prescriptions. Let's look at uh, a little more detail in certain areas. So that we're going to talk about uh, three things. The first one is macronutrients, uh, the second is micronutrients, and the third is food preparation. And we're going to talk about nutrition prescriptions in these three different environments. So let's look at macronutrients first. Everyone here knows macronutrients are your proteins, your fats, and your carbohydrates. So how do those uh, affect, uh, or how do we calculate those in as we write nutrition prescriptions? And um, the, the first thing is just some general guidelines. I actually think that Michael Pollan, who's a journalist, uh, did a be the best job of describing our diet, what our diet should be, in a succinct way. So he says, eat food, not too much, mostly plants. Um, I think that's a, a very great way of describing how you eat food. And we'll talk more later. I, the emphasis here is, is food. It's not chemicals, it's food um, that, that he wants us to eat. Not too much of it, mostly plants. So a couple of uh, ways of looking at that. Uh, food means whole foods whole. I actually think the biggest challenge that we have worldwide as far as nutrition is the concept of processed foods. I spent yesterday um, here in Taiwan going on uh, the high-speed uh, rail and the buses down to Sun Moon Lake. Um, and uh, it was interesting to look at the food that was available in the train stations. I can tell you that the United States is not alone as far as having lots of processed food. And I, I, I get to travel a fair bit and I see this all over the world. I've seen it in rural villages in, in Honduras. I've seen it in the middle of Africa, in hospitals in Rwanda, where people are eating processed food. Our biggest problem is we have too much uh, processed food and not enough whole food. And then you have to have a variety of, of foods. So just a, an ex a reminder of what whole foods are. The apple is the whole food. Anywhere you go along this spectrum, you're getting further and further away from the whole food. So applesauce is still pretty good, but it's not quite as whole as that, an apple. The apple juice is even less whole. The apple pie includes a bunch of other ingredients, so it's even less whole. And so you can imagine, uh, as, as you put things in your mouth, what happened to it since it was grown and when it's going in my mouth. And, and if you can't even imagine what happened to it, then it's probably not even food. It's probably a mixture of chemicals and, and other things that you're putting into your mouth and we're, we call it food, but it's, it's probably not food. So it's good to eat a variety of foods every day. Um, there's some evidence that shooting for 20 is good, but uh, it probably doesn't matter so much the number you put here, just to, as long as you're eating uh, a variety of things on a daily basis. Now, one of the things that happens is, is I have patients who will come to me and they'll say, so you say this, I hear someone else say that, I hear someone else say that, I hear another doctor say this, I'm so confused, what do I do as far as food? Um, one of the things I like to show to my patients is there is this, this organization called the True Health Initiative, which is thousands of doctors from all over the world, um, not just doctors, dietitians, uh, all types of health professionals from all over the world, who all agree around this basic diet. And what is that basic diet? It's basically what Michael Pollan said. Eat food, not too much, mostly plants. So if, if your patients are worried about the different gurus out there that say different things, point them to this place where there's uh, lots of people who say the same thing. 
Okay, the three types of macronutrients. Uh, the first one we'll talk about is protein. Uh, I don't know what, what it's like in Taiwan, but in the United States, the culture has become such that when people hear the word protein, they think of meat. Um, that's, that's been developed by the meat industry. The meat industry wants people to think that, that if you need protein, you need to eat meat. Um, it's actually not quite the case. Um, so I was surprised when I heard this. I don't know if any of you will be surprised, but there's actually more protein per calorie in broccoli than there is in beef. So you actually get more protein for each calorie that you're eating, you're getting more protein in broccoli than you are uh, in, in beef. Now that's per calorie. Obviously you can eat a huge plate of broccoli and not eat very many calories, or if you eat a huge plate of meat, you get a lot of calories. So for a, the amount, for a size, there's more protein in the meat. But for the calories, which is the more important uh, thing, then, then broccoli is your better source of protein. Uh, and then most people don't realize, uh, I'm sure most of you here do realize, but most people don't realize that beans are a great source of protein. And per size, um, they're frequently getting close to equivalent to certain kinds of meat. So um, you don't have to think of meat uh, as your protein source. Uh, I encourage my patients to get uh, at least half, if not more, of their protein from plant-based uh, protein sources. So this would be um, one of my most common prescriptions uh, where I'm trying to get someone to have more protein. Um, I prescribe them legumes, uh, which would be beans or lentils uh, of any kind, um, and I want them to have that on a regular basis uh, so that they can decrease the amount um, of, of frequently, if you, if you give them beans for protein instead of uh, animal products, then they'll have less fat in their diet, which usually is an important thing when they're fighting diabetes and hyperlipidemia and other diseases. So that was a, a quick few slides on protein. Uh, now a few slides on fat. Um, when I prescribe uh, fat nutrition, they're usually negative prescriptions because most people, um, at least in the United States, and I suspect that's also true here in Taiwan, uh, eat too much fat. Is that true? Do people eat too much fat in Taiwan on average? A lot of heads saying yes. Um, so, um, the typical doctor will say eat less fat, or they may say eat less saturated fat. But again, when we're um, looking at, at good nutrition prescriptions that actually make a difference, you need to get specific. I don't know how we got John's slide here. So something happened where I switched slide sets. John wasn't finished with his talk. magic I didn't know I had. <laughs> so uh, when we talk about fat, there's uh, three kinds of fat. Um, there's polyunsaturated, monounsaturated, and saturated fats. And then of course uh, we also talk about trans fats. Um, and generally the polyunsaturated and the monounsaturated are considered not so bad. The, the saturated fats are considered uh, mainly harmful and the trans fats are considered always harmful. Um, so as a general rule, we say saturated fats should be minimized or eliminated. And as a general rule, we say trans fats should be eliminated completely. Now, within saturated fats, there's actually different kinds. So there's uh, palmitic and myristic acid which are harmful saturated fats. And then there's uh, lauric and stearic acid. So um, something that's talked about a lot um, in the United States right now is coconut oil. And is coconut, or coconut's good for you or bad for you? Um, 
the, the saturated fat in coconuts is not as harmful as the saturated fat that we see in a lot of our oils and a lot of our processed foods. It's the, the um, palmitic acid that tends to show up in processed foods primarily. Um, but uh, the, the, it's, it's still saturated fat. And one of the big problems with coconut is a lot of the coconut that people are now eating, the coconut oil and, and a lot of the other coconut products are very uh, processed. And again, rule number one is whole food. So this is, this is just an example or, or sort of looking at the different types of saturated fat in different uh, items. So you can see here coconut oil, again, is mainly lauric acid. Um, but, but again, palmitic acid, one of, the, one of the harmful saturated fats, is the biggest source uh, of fat in the majority of foods that we eat. So is, did anybody read about this study? This, this just came out here in the last uh, few days. This was an article in Lancet, uh, March 17th, so that's actually two days ago it was published, um, about the Shimani Indians. The Shimani Indians live in Bolivia, in the, the Amazon Delta, so sort of in the, in the inland portion of Bolivia, in the low, lowland portion of Bolivia. They're very isolated, they hardly eat any processed food. And so they've been studied uh, for things like heart disease, and what we've found is actually they have close to 0% heart disease um, uh, when, when they're studied. Uh, part of this is because they don't smoke and they, they tend to be very active as they go through the day. But look at their diet. 72% carbs, 14% fat, 14% protein. I actually think this is a great um, mix of, of what we want, uh, 72, 14, and 14. Uh, they, they basically don't have saturated fat in their diet. There's, there's little to no saturated fat um, in their diet. So, so this would be, um, I think, an example of what we're looking at as far as macronutrients and the breakdown of macronutrients in our diet. Uh, in the United States right now, it's about 34% uh, of calories come from fat. So it's, it's way too high in the United States. So again, this would be an example of a fat prescription, um, and I will usually write, uh, my, my most common fat prescription is try to get cheese out of people's diet. Uh, in the United States, cheese is our greatest source of saturated fat, and uh, I actually think cheese is sort of like red meat. It's something that you, you should rarely have, um, if, if at all, um, and if you do have it in small amounts. Okay, so we talked about protein, uh, we talked about fat, uh, now let's talk about carbohydrates a little bit. Um, so carbohydrates, uh, in the United States, one of the things that I find very interesting and to be honest a little bit frustrating is people talk about carbs being bad. Well, carbs are not bad. Um, hopefully everyone here realizes that. Uh, obviously the simple carbs, the processed simple carbs do tend to be bad. Uh, but uh, other carbs, the, the carbs that are full of uh, uh, fibers and starches, uh, tend to be good. So uh, just a reminder, there are three components of, of carbs. So this is a, a dietary label from, from the United States. Uh, in that label is listed the fiber and the sugar under carbs. And of course, the other thing that's, that's there is starch. So there's three components of starch. Uh, again. The only component that's bad is the processed sugar. So there's natural sugars. And starting next year, um, these dietary labels are going to change. And they're going to actually differentiate between the, the processed sugars and the natural sugars. Natural sugars tend to be OK. Processed sugars tend to be, uh, not be, uh, tend to be harmful. Um, but fiber is obviously good. And, and generally, uh, starch tends to be OK as well. So we're trying to increase fiber, we're trying to decrease processed sugars, and we're trying to stay steady on the starch. So more na magic, now it's not changing. It's changing on my computer here. <coughs> Thank <laughs> you.
Dr. Dr. Kelly is so famous that his slide says, uh, always dominate. Um, so what, what we're talking about um, is, is the value of fiber. And uh, fiber obviously is, is very helpful um, as far as doing things like lowering cholesterol. It's very helpful as far as uh, dealing with diabetes. Um, it's helpful if people have digestive issues, either diarrhea or constipation. Um, so, um, so we like fiber, um, and for all the reasons we just talked about, it, it helps people lose weight, um, decreases colon cancer. So how much fiber do we need? Um, in the United States right now, the average person eats in the neighborhood of 10, 12, maybe 15 grams of fiber a day if, if, they're, if they're doing well. The goal is three to four times that much. So women, I like to see my patients eat 40 grams of fiber a day and men 45 grams of fiber a day. Does anybody know how much fiber they eat every day? Does anybody track that? Most people haven't. I'd encourage you to track how much fiber you eat on a daily basis. Um, what I can tell you, because I've done this, if, if you follow that daily dozen, you will e easily get uh, this amount of fiber. If you don't follow the daily dozen, um, it's easy to slip off and, and get much less than that. So the best source of fiber is legumes, uh, lentils and beans. I, again, encourage my patients uh, to have beans regularly. You, you remember the Daily Dozen app recommended three servings uh, per day. Their serving size on the Daily Dozen app was half a cup, so they're, they're recommending, um, I know uh, in, in America we use the old-fashioned cup process. It's, uh, anyways, um, so one of the things that people say, well, if I need more fiber, then I'll just take a fiber supplement. But again, what was our first rule? Our first rule was uh, whole food is the best way to get any of this. Um, so you want to have fiber um, that comes in the whole food, uh, and ideally fiber that, that comes in foods that have a fair bit of water as well as uh, fiber in them. Okay, uh, we're next going to talk about micronutrients um, and how nutrition prescriptions fit in micronutrients. As a reminder, micronutrients are the vitamins and the minerals that, that we're uh, eating on a regular basis. So um, when you prescribe micronutrients, again, generally you want to prescribe a specific type of food, um, not a food family, but sometimes you can do the food family as well. And, and I do do food family some as I'm encouraging my patients to do uh, types of foods. So. Um, Generally, I don't prescribe the micronutrient itself. What we've done in nutrition research is we've tended to look at micronutrients and think that the, the magic is in that micronutrient. But for those of you who are researchers, um, you've probably recognized that more and more the research is saying that the micronutrient actually doesn't make the difference. It's the package, the food package that the micronutrient's in that actually makes the difference. Um, so again, that is, is why we prescribe the food, uh, not the micronutrients. So the micronutrients uh, tend to be high in antioxidants. They tend to incre increase the, the strength of our immune system. These are things that are important as we fight cancer as well as a variety of chronic diseases. So. This idea of decreasing inflammation and increasing immune health are important concepts when we think of micronutrients and we think of interacting with our patients around nutrition prescriptions. So what I'm gonna do is talk about um, some food families uh, that either go against this um, or, or help it. So there's actually uh, seven slides, uh, two of them go against it and five of them help uh, as far as this decreasing inflammation and increasing the immune health. So the first one is uh, the processed grains. Um, these are, are things that increase inflammation and decrease our immune production.
those processed grains uh, in, show up in, in a variety of different grains in the United States. Uh, it's by far the most in wheat, but there's also corn. Uh, there's also a fair amount of processed rice. Um, all of these are processed grains and not near as healthy for you. In fact, they increase your glycemic index, uh, they, and they tend to increase uh, chronic disease issues. So we're, we're prescribing again. So it's not uncommon for me to tell my patients, I want you to eat no wheat products for the next three months, or I want you to eat, you know, stay away specifically from bread, or stay away from a specific, um, uh, you know, type of food that has this processed grains in it. The other big negative prescription or thing that we're trying to keep people away from is the processed fats. We already talked about uh, no trans fats and little to, to no saturated fats. Um, so again, um, we'll prescribe specific things like no cheese, no red meat. Um, actually, I'll tell my patients, if you like red meat, um, you can have it twice a year. Um, for your birthday and for, for a holiday. They actually laugh too when I tell them that. But, but they actually take it seriously too. If you give them a specific thing like that, they'll, they'll, they'll be able to wrap their, their arms around it and go forward with that advice. Okay, what are the good things? Um, the Daily Dozen, that app that I mentioned, uh, lists, uh, they divide fruits and vegetables into five different categories. Um, I'm gonna talk about most of those here. The first category is cruciferous vegetables. Um, they're high in sulforaphanes and indole 3 carbonyls. Um, in the Daily Dozen, uh, the recommendation is they have one serving of these every single day, at least one serving of them every single day, which I think is a great idea. I'll, I'll prescribe cruciferous vegetables anytime I have a patient who has an inflammatory uh, issue going on because these are some of the, the strongest anti-inflammatory uh, categories of food out there. Dark green leafy vegetables, um, most of us know that those are very healthy. Uh, in the daily dozen, the recommendation is two servings of these every day. Um, I, I think that's uh, good to get at least that also. Uh, dark green leafies are high in, in multiple minerals as well as uh, uh, in um, multiple vitamins. The carotenoids, uh, these aren't separated out in the daily dozen, but uh, it's important to try to get these on a regular basis as well, um, probably on a daily basis. Uh, get carotenoids of some type uh, that you find in tomatoes and carrots and uh, some of your yams and the, sort of the orange and red uh, fruits and vegetables. Um, Aliaceous vegetables, uh, again, the daily dozen doesn't separate these out, um, but getting some garlic or onions or leeks uh, in your diet on a daily basis is good as far as um, decreasing inflammation, increasing those antioxidants, uh, uh, improving the, the health of your immune system. Uh, and then dark berries, again, the, the Daily Dozen does separate this out as, as something you should have every single day, some type of dark berry. Uh, also with dark berries uh, is pomegranates and cherries, they also fit uh, in as far as the allergic acids and the polyphenols uh, that are uh, great as far as anti-inflammatory foods. Uh, again, if I'm fighting inflammation, besides cruciferous vegetables, this is probably the, the prescription that I give uh, the most commonly. Um, I tell patients, just, just get it frozen. You can, uh, I, I don't know what it's like in Taiwan, but in, in the United States, you can get uh, go to the, the grocery store and you can get uh, relatively inexpensive bags of frozen berries and just keep those in your refrigerator or your freezer um, for a snack and it, it tends to work well. Okay, the last thing that we're going to talk about um, is food preparation. So we talked about uh, macronutrients and micronutrients. I want to talk a little bit about food preparation and how that affects um, the food prescriptions that we give our patients. So uh, this discussion is focusing on the concept of advanced glycated end products. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with AGES or advanced glycated end products, these are um, oxidative stress byproducts. 
that come, uh, basically, this is a, a, a detailed slide. Um, so for those of you who are, are doing the biochemistry, uh, you're familiar with these types of slides. Uh, for those of you who want a, a simpler look, um, this describes how the glucose and the protein uh, create the shift uh, bases, uh, which create the amidori products and the reactive intermediates. Uh, and end up with this oxidative stress product called AGES, or advanced glycosylated end products. Uh, and age uh, pathways uh, affect uh, inflammation and fibrosis throughout our bodies. Uh, one of the things that's uh, fascinating to me is watching how age accumulates in different tissues. So um, in, in this slide, we, we look at the blue dots, uh, which are the age accumulation in the um, lens of our eye, and then the white dots, which is the age accumulations in our skin. And you can see as we get older, as we go over time, um, the age accumulates in both the eyes as well as the skin, but it accumulates in the eyes much uh, more dramatically than in the skin, and part of that is because the, um, nerve, or the cells in the eyes don't turn over very quickly. So it's, it's these slow turnover cells, like nerve cells, uh, the, the, the cells of the lenses in our eyes where the age accumulation is the most significant. It's interesting that it's those same types of cells that we have issues with, um, with diabetes. So diabetics get uh, cataracts, they get neuropathies, um, and part of that is because of these age accumulations in those cells. So um, we sort of talked about this in the other slide, the, the body glycase, the small uh, proportion of simple sugars in your food, um, and then it sort of turns into these ages. Uh, everybody is accumulating ages no matter how they eat. Uh, our body has the ability to deal with some of these oxidative stress products, um, but if there's a lot of them that build up, uh, then it leads to cell damage over time. So we want to decrease the amount of these oxidative stress products in our bodies as much as possible. So how do we do that with food? Um, we, we do it with food by looking at, at where the age sources are. Um, and again, some of them just, there's oxidative stress that just happens naturally in our body, uh, but they're also um, more common in foods that are, are cooked and, and foods that, that are cooked in a dry format. So cooking your foods um, for a shorter period of time, cooking them in a wet format, uh, using water or uh, to, to, to boil or steam for your food, that tends to decrease ages versus uh, cooking them with, with oil or um, uh, grilling them, that tends to increase the ages in your foods. So I wanna look at the results of a study that was done at Mount Sinai Medical Center in New York where they, look, where they took a variety of different types of food and then analyzed them for certain types of advanced glycosylated end products. There's many types of advanced glycosylated end products. So they didn't an analyze every single one of those, but they analyzed uh, some of the, the most common ones. Um, and this is an example of these uh, age products in food. So my pointer's not working anymore, but you can see here um, there is you know, 10, 20, 40 uh, advanced glycosylated end product uh, kilo units per serving um, in, in a lot of foods, but, but it's higher in a, in a few foods. Um, it goes up a lot in the grilled vegetables, so, so straight green, green beans is not so high, but you grill them and all of a sudden you're increasing it by tenfold or so. Um, and then you look at uh, dried figs. Um, it's, it's much higher in dried figs um, because again, there's this, this dry uh, heat process uh, that is used to get to dried figs. On the bottom, you can see it's very interesting. If you take the exact same food, pasta, and you cook it for eight minutes, it's uh, only 112. If you, if you cook it for four more minutes, so you just add 50% more of cooking time, and all of a sudden the AGEs doubled um, for that pasta. So again, the length of time you cook food um, will make these oxidative stress products worse. So this is uh, other foods. Um, the top uh, several ones here are potatoes. 
And you can see uh, a boiled potato is not too bad as far as these uh, AGEs. Um, a roasted potato, uh, it's, it's a drier environment, it's under the heat longer, so it increases again by over tenfold. But then look what, you, what happens when you start uh, using more of a processed potato um, that's fried at McDonald's, uh, 1500, so it's, it's really high. Um, if you do those, those same French fries homemade, it's, it's not quite as processed, it's, it's still high, but not quite as bad. So, if we thought the french fries were bad, how about the hamburger? It's, it's way worse. And uh, the, the one that, that's most interesting to me here is the bacon. And of course, bacon, um, we, the World Health Organization came out last year and said, basically, that bacon's like cancer. Um, the, I mean, bacon's like cigarettes, I should say, as far as causing cancer. Um, so, so bacon is, is I, I just had a patient uh, Thursday uh, that I, they, they were eating bacon every other morning for breakfast. Um, and both of them, it was a couple actually, a husband and wife, and both of them had high cholesterol um, and were dealing with uh, chronic diseases. Uh, both, one had diabetes, the other had prediabetes. And I, I talked to them about bacon, and they said, okay, I'm going to stop. Uh, I gave them a, a no-bacon prescription. I actually wrote that down on the prescription pad, no bacon. And they felt they could actually stop the bacon because of, of how bad it is. Um, so not only does it, uh, is it high in saturated fat, but it's also high in all, all of uh, these AGEs. Um, and you, you can see the others on the list here, um, but the bottom line is... When you, when you start going towards animal products, uh, it's much higher in these oxidative stress products, or these oxidative stress uh, reactants. So the advice that we give our patients as far as AGEs is to increase the consumption of vegetables, fruits, legumes, and whole grains, um, decrease the consumption of fatty meats and solid fats and highly processed foods, and uh, prepare foods more by boiling, stewing, and broiling and less by grilling, baking, and frying. So in summary, uh, nutrition prescriptions uh, should be a regular part of, of our practice as healthcare professionals. And um, there are ways that we can help with our nutrition prescriptions by being specific as far as uh, eating more whole foods, more vegetables, fruits, and legumes less fat and processed foods, uh, and less animal products, uh, and using specific foods and not supplements. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Wayne Dyson.